Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're just going to give everybody a few more minutes to, to sign on. We'll start in a couple of minutes. Okay, I think we can get started. So welcome everyone to this session on addressing online sexual abuse and exploitation, a call for international standards. My name is Carolina Henrique Schmitz and I'm the director of Trust Law, the global pro bono program of the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Through Trust Law, we connect NGOs and social enterprises working to create social and environmental change with free legal assistance, research tools and trainings from the best legal teams around the globe to support their operations, their advocacy, and ultimately maximize their impact. I have the pleasure of being your moderator today. And before we begin, I'd like to extend a special thanks to Equality Now and the governments of Finland and Australia for co-sponsoring this event and convening us today for an important conversation on the need for international standards to address online sexual abuse and exploitation. If you've joined us today, you're probably aware that sexual exploitation and abuse is being extended to online spaces with children, girls, and women being disproportionately affected. Across the globe, women and girls are facing a growing crisis of online abuse and harassment that silences, disempowers, and harms them. Online sexual harms are not happening in a vacuum. Online sexual abuse occurs as part of a continuum of gender-based violence. It is rooted in the same sex, gender, and systemic inequality and discrimination. Perpetrators are abusing children of all ages online. They're also preying on the vulnerability of adolescent girls and young women, controlling them over time and trapping them in a sexual exploitation, both online and offline. Globally, the scale and scope of online sexual abuse is astounding and growing at an alarming rate. With the widespread use of the internet, these age-old crimes are taking new forms and being perpetrated and amplified online with impunity and anonymity. In this context, Equality Now undertook legal research through the Trust Law Program to examine international, regional, and national legal frameworks relating to online sexual abuse and to highlight gaps and loopholes in these frameworks. The research, which was generally supported by a number of law firms across the globe that we're very thankful to, also considers the role that digital rights and technology companies play in the protection from and perpetuation of online sexual exploitation and abuse. The findings of these research show that laws have not kept up with the technological advances that make online sexual exploitation and abuse possible. Instead, there's a patchwork of legislation that address different, but not all aspects of online sexual exploitation and abuse. They're also not aligned or joined up and often do not adequately take into account the technological aspects of online abuse. These gaps result, of course, in inadequate safeguards to protect victims. Additionally, the laws and instruments do not sufficiently provide for dealing with balancing competing rights of privacy and freedom of expression online, on the one hand, and protection of online sexual exploitation abuse, on the other. It's apparent that international and national legal frameworks were not designed to fully address the gendered, technological, and multi-jurisdictional nature and dimensions of online sexual exploitation and abuse, nor the scale at which it is happening today. As a global problem, Online sexual exploitation requires a global solution, 
through cooperation and coordination among governments, international bodies, tech companies, civil society, and survivors. As a critical first step, governments are invited to consider the development and adoption of international standards as the guiding framework of, of national legal and policy reform. So Equality Now and the governments of Finland and Australia have convened us today to start this important discussion in the context of the 65th session on the Convention of the Status of Women. This will surely be the first of many such conversations, which will be further informed by the report Equality Now will produce on this research in the next few months. So today's event will consist of a two-part session. First, we will hear from leading advocates who will provide us with an understanding of the gender-based technological and legal challenges and nuances that are involved in online sexual exploitation and abuse. Then we will hear from government and international and regional body representatives on their approach to online sexual exploitation and uh, as, as a multi-jurisdictional problem and their perspective on the need for international standards. We're in for a treat. This is truly a stellar panel of experts. Before I turn it over to each of these panelists, a couple of housekeeping items. First, we're gonna leave ample time for Q&A at the end of all presentations. So in the meantime, we ask that you please send through any questions you may have in the chat, indicating who the question is addressed to. The panelists will tackle these in the Q&A towards the end of the session. And second housekeeping item, we will be recording this session and we'll be sending it to attendees after the event. So if you have to miss any part of it or you wanna share it with, with other participants, colleagues, friends, please do. Without further ado, I'm delighted to start our first session and introduce Titi Matker. Titi is the global lead for ending sex trafficking at Equality Now. In her role, she provides strategic leadership on the organization's global program to end sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. Titi is a passionate advocate for women's rights and has worked with other women's rights organizations in the UK and in Zimbabwe. Titi will share the key findings and recommendations from Equality Now's research and will address the tension between privacy and protection of on, against online sexual harms. Over to you, Titi. Uh, thank you, Carolina. Um, I'm just going to share my presentation. Um, so in conducting the research, we wanted to understand the existing legal framework and standards available at the international, regional, and national levels, particularly understanding what is it that they are saying and what are the gaps and opportunities. Uh, so we essentially had four key um, research issues or questions. Firstly, looking to understanding what constitutes online sexual exploitation and, uh, and abuse what is the legal framework in terms of addressing the interaction between online digital rights and online safety and protection of users, particularly looking at uh, freedom of expression and the right to privacy online as the, as the digital rights. And we also wanted to understand what the law says in terms of jurisdictional issues relating to the investigation and prosecution of online sexual exploitation and abuse crimes. Uh, considering that, um, you know, as the way the internet works, victims, perpetrators, and even the platforms where the abuse is taking place may not necessarily be under a single jurisdiction. And we also wanted to understand what the law says around the role, accountability, and regulation of uh, tech companies. Our methodology was really informed uh, by our understanding that online sexual exploitation and abuse is a form of sexual violence and is therefore gendered and occurs as part of the continuum of uh, gender-based violence. So we looked at the definition of online sexual and, uh, exploitation and abuse uh, from a very wide lens to include a range of uh, predatory and harmful behaviors uh, but we are also cognizant that although we are able to identify specific forms, uh, that this list is not exhaustive as technology is ever evolving, new forms of sexual exploitation are emerging and will continue to do so in the future. We have seen in recent years um, the growing use of artificial intelligence and other technological tools uh, to generate and circulate videos and, and images that resemble uh, real, uh, real people in the use of, uh, you know, what we commonly call uh, deep fakes. Um, so we also looked at uh, multiple jurisdictions, the international level, the, the EU regional level, 
and five specific countries. And as Carolina mentioned at the beginning, uh, we were supported by trust law and teams uh, of lawyers within six law firms located across the different jurisdictions. Uh, we were also, also very particularly grateful to the contribution of our CSO partners in the five countries who were able to connect us with survivors on the ground to be able to bring out um, uh, or paint a picture around survivor experiences, particularly when they are seeking uh, uh, to access uh, justice uh, through the criminal justice system. Um, so in terms of our key findings, I think one of the very key things that comes out is that laws have simply not kept pace with uh, technological advances. Um, so whilst uh, it's a commonly referred term, you know, online sexual exploitation, what we saw is that at the international level, there's no one single international binding legal instrument that looks at this in particular and the range of uh, harms and offenses that are, are connected to it. Instead, what we have is multiple laws and standards that provide for different, but not all aspects of online sexual exploitation and abuse including those that are looking at children's rights, women's rights, cybersecurity, human trafficking, civil and political rights, and so on. And while some of the laws, uh, especially those that speak to children's rights and women's rights, could be said to apply to violence that also occurs on the internet, in some cases, they don't really uh, provide for the nuances in how online sexual exploitation and abuse is actually occurring today as perpetrators are finding new ways to exploit. So for instance, in the Lanzarote Convention, online grooming of children is criminalized only when there's an intention to meet a child. Whereas in reality, with how technology is working today, it's not really necessary for an offender to physically meet a child to commit um, a serious sexual offense. And across the, we also see the replication of uh, some of the gaps at the international level, um, at, at the national level. Uh, we also saw in particular recent efforts to address some of the gaps. So we saw the CEDAW committee coming up with their general recommendation last year on trafficking in women and girls and making particular recommendations on um, how governments can address the, the, the use of digital technology in trafficking of women and girls. Um, the Committee on the Rights of the Child as well issued a general recommendation on the rights of uh, children in the digital space. Another key finding was around the tensions between digital rights and protection and safety online for users. Uh, freedom of expression and privacy are fundamental pillars uh, of a well-functioning um, uh, internet, but they can also come into tension with the right to safety from online harms. Um, in the first instance, uh, privacy, for instance, and the rules around data protection will provide anonymity, but this is uh, being exploited by perpetrators to commit violations without detection. There have also been calls uh, from by some of the platforms for uh, stronger use of encryption to protect individuals, meaning that the data is only then readable by senders and receivers and not third parties. However, this move would impose a challenge around the detection of online sexual exploitation and abuse content and would potentially enable offenders to hide their criminal activity shield themselves from detection and continue to operate with impunity. Uh, we saw as well uh, from the EU uh, in December last year how the amendment to the EU's directive, the EU privacy directive resulted in ambiguity around the legality of the use of voluntary and online detection tools that enable tech companies to identify and remove uh, child sexual abuse material online. Um, and what we saw is um, an alarming 46% drop in child sexual expert, uh, abuse content being reported uh, by the different uh, platforms. So there are fundamental questions, I think, here for, for governments and the international community around what laws should be put in place to ensure that people are protected from online harm while at the same time protecting 
uh, users uh, freedom of expression and privacy? And how can we ensure that privacy and freedom of information are not used by offenders to undermine the right to safety and, and protection and shield uh, perpetrators uh, from prosecution and enable them to perpetuate um, uh, and, and, and perpetuate their impunity. Um, another key finding around the role and accountability of uh, technology companies is that it is not necessarily properly defined and provided for in law. Uh, we've seen that the internet is largely unregulated and um, users are having to rely on companies' voluntary standards and practices. And very few countries have uh, specific laws that impose liability and accountability uh, on, on tech platforms. And in some cases where laws are being put in place, uh, they are being viewed as infringing on freedom of expression and privacy rights. We've seen this in the context of the US uh, with um, you know, some of the discussions or conversations that have happened around ENIT, uh, where it's being seen really as uh, potentially in terms of how it would be interpreted as uh, 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 potential to infringe on freedom of expression and privacy online. Um, so in terms of our overarching you know, sort of recommendations, I think what the legal research has been able to do is to affirm that we are dealing with a global and multi-jurisdictional problem that really requires harmonized and coordinated response from the international community. And that we cannot be looking at this only through national silos, but that actually the national responses and mechanisms need to be supported by a strong and interconnected international response uh, framework and mechanisms. Uh, therefore, the, 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 the need for international standards is, a, is, is really a critical part of the solution. And our conclusion is that we, you know, in the long term, we should be looking to an international instrument, but in the medium term, utilizing the opportunities that are existing in, in, in terms of in, uh, existing you know, conventions and instruments and clarifying for instance, through general comments or recommendations, how these instruments should apply specifically to, to, to online sexual exploitation and abuse. We see that there's a tremendous appetite at national and international levels to act. Um, as we have already seen with the Committee on the Rights of the Child with CEDO, um, and you know, to look at really how we can be in the, in the immediate term using some of the opportunities presented by existing legislation to, to address this issue, including um, ensuring that technology companies um, have legal responsibility and accountability um, in law, and that, that is you know, sort of enshrined in law uh, rather than them being always left to uh, voluntary standards or self-regulation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Titi. Uh, we really look forward to seeing that report when it comes out. Um, it sounds like there are a lot of very interesting learnings. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to our next panelist. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Yasmin Vafa. She's the co-founder and executive director of Rights for Girls, a US-based human rights organization dedicated to defending the rights of vulnerable young women and girls. A human rights attorney and advocate, y Yasmin's work focuses on the intersection of race, gender, violence, and the law. She currently serves on the US Department of Health and Human Services National Advisory Committee on the Sex Trafficking of Children and Youth and is an adjunct judicial educator for the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. Yasmin is going to speak um, about the need for regulation, highlighting the challenges of securing protection for women and girls in the US, drawing on the example of the FOSTA-SESTA uh, and the proposed Earn It legislation. Over to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Carolina, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on such an important topic today. Um, as you mentioned, Rights for Girls works to end gender-based violence against young women and girls in the United States. And although the United States holds itself out to be a leader on gender equality and women's rights, uh, the truth is that our young women and girls are not safe. The rates of gender-based violence here are absolutely staggering. 
experts uh, estimate that an American is sexually assaulted every 73 seconds in the United States, with the majority of these victims being women and children. In fact, our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate that one in four American girls will experience some form of sexual violence before even reaching the age of 18. We also know that the COVID-19 pandemic has really exacerbated the vulnerabilities that leading to an increase in both family violence as well as um, sexual exploitation and child abuse challenges caused by unemployment, loss of wages, uh, housing instability, food insecurity have really fueled so many of the increases we've seen in gender-based violence, including things like familial trafficking, landlord exploitation, and other forms of child exploitation. In addition, prolonged periods of isolation and online exposure have led to dramatic increases in online exploitation, including child exploitation on the internet. Uh, just to give a sense of the scope of the problem and what has um, really resulted in the last several years, in 2008, 600,000 videos and images of child sexual abuse material on the internet were reported to our National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMIC which is our national clearinghouse um, that operates what's known as the cyber tip line here in the United States and collects this data. Just 10 years later, in 2019, NICMIC reported over 69 million images uh, of child sexual abuse content and videos. And so it's just, it was considered an epidemic back in 2008 and now it's just an unfathomable explosion in this content. Uh, and unfortunately, due to the pandemic, these numbers have even gone uh, up higher. And so they just released their 2020 data, which revealed a 28% increase in reports to their cyber tip line, including a 98% increase in online enticement reports alone. And so really this is just a staggering problem and one that requires our urgent attention. Uh, the challenge then for us as advocates and service providers is not just difficulty in serving these victims who have experienced unimaginable trauma, not just in the physical and sexual abuse that they've suffered, but in the fact that this abuse is now being circulated uh, and shared globally uh, continuously, but ensuring safety and justice for survivors and their families. Uh, and here in the United States, there are some very unique and distinct challenges to trying to secure accountability, as well as removing and ultimately preventing this type of content on the internet. Uh, first, in the United States, like many other places, we have very strong protections under our constitution related to free speech and privacy rights, which make regulation of the internet incredibly challenging. Uh, second, we're dealing with uh, the tech lobby as advocates, um, which is obviously a very sophisticated, well-funded apparatus that makes advocating for things like accountability or regulation, uh, particularly on behalf of victims who in many cases are already incredibly marginalized and vulnerable. Uh, it makes it very, very difficult. And third, and probably uh, most importantly, we have a law that provides substantial protections to internet service providers, and that is the Communication Decency Act, and specifically Section 230, which protects uh, and provides virtual immunity to uh, internet service providers or ISPs from all third-party content. And so under this law, websites are shielded from both state and federal civil liability as well as state criminal liability for third-party content, whether or not they're aware of it or whether or not they refuse to take it down. And so what this looks like practically is that for years, child sex trafficking survivors and their families uh, watched in horror as court after court denied them relief against websites that knowingly advertised and profited off the sale of their children for sex. Uh, in 2017, after several courts declared that there was nothing they could do and that this was a problem for Congress to address and fix, a huge push by survivors and their families and advocates um, led to the introduction of legislation to finally seek to limit the scope of CDA 230 immunity when it came to the problem of child sex trafficking and, and sex trafficking. Uh, families testified before Congress that they would call websites uh, pretty mainstream websites to ask for sex ads of their children who were just teenagers to be removed. Uh, mothers pleaded with lawmakers to help curb the proliferation of sex ads that allowed their daughters to be sold on websites alongside couches and bicycles with impunity. Um, there were mothers who talked about uh, the devastation they faced when their daughters were murdered by sex buyers who had purchased them. One, one young woman, um, Desiree Robinson, was just 16 years old and was killed on Christmas Day. And so really there was an outpouring 
uh, of advocacy and urgency from uh, survivors and their families. And so all of this led to a uh, bipartisan introduction of legislation that was overwhelmingly passed um, here on Capitol Hill called FOSTA-SESTA, which for the first time created a, a really narrow exception to crime of gender-based violence and specifically sex trafficking. And that brought immunity that was afforded under CDA 230. Uh, and what it did was allow victims to sue for civil damages, uh, as well as allowing states to pursue criminal charges against bad actor websites that knowingly facilitated sex trafficking or promoted prostitution, which it's worth noting are very, very difficult, high standards. Uh, and so even though it's been incredibly difficult to obtain justice, it finally opened the courthouse doors to victims and their families to at least seek uh, accountability for the first time. And practically what this meant was that bad actor websites were now incentivized to rid themselves of this illegal and violent content, or at least uh, face some sort of liability. Uh, but with the increased presence of the internet and, and with everything that we're hearing today, we know that we need to tackle more than just sex trafficking. Uh, as crimes of gender-based violence go online, we need to adapt our laws to provide better protection and accountability for perpetrators of this violence, whether it's through acts of sex torsion, revenge porn, cyber stalking and harassment or other violent crimes. Uh, here in Washington, DC, we hear from young girls every day who are being bought and sold online on social media websites, uh, on Instagram Live, on um, you know, Snapchat. Uh, we hear about traffickers exploiting women and girls on mainstream websites like OnlyFans, Pornhub, other online platforms. And as I mentioned, the huge and um, you know, explosion of child sexual abuse imagery and content that has only increased in recent years. And so currently there's an effort underway to create another exception to CDA immunity for this type of material. Um, in addition, it would create a commission that would come up with evolving best practices and minimum standards that reputable sites and tech platforms should adhere to. Uh, and this effort is known as the Earn It Act. Uh, this was bipartisan legislation that was introduced last year. We expect it to be introduced again in this Congress. It received an overwhelming amount of support in the Senate and particularly our Senate Judiciary Committee, um, which you know, just shows how people are finally understanding the importance of tackling these issues. Uh, it also shows that self-regulation hasn't worked. Uh, when we have some websites and tech platforms that are reporting zero instances of child sexual abuse material while others are reporting millions, uh, there clearly needs to be a uniform standard and set of best practices that reputable sites are adhering to in order to create a safe environment for women and children. Um, national standards, unfortunately, I think will not be enough. I think international cooperation is really needed uh, and the development of minimum standards and best practices and norms that are needed to ensure worldwide accountability and to make clear that women and children are not acceptable collateral damage for a private uh, and free internet. And so uh, with that, our, our hope is to be able to work with our international partners, with advocates and survivors worldwide to urge for cooperation and for the establishment of some sort of best practices and guides that uh, can be adhered to to provide the maximum amount of protection while also balancing those uh, with um, values that we all cherish, which is a free uh, and open internet. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for that, that really important um, uh, input and insight into the experience in the US and, and this, uh, sharing with us the scale of the crime that we're dealing with and the challenge that we're dealing with. Um, it's, I think it's, it's an important context setting um, and it, it leads us into the second part of the conversation, looking really at what that, that international, what international standards could look like and that kind of international core cooperation might be. Um, so thank you again to Titi and Yasmin for, for their input and insights. We're now gonna move on to the second part of the session. And again, just as a reminder, the Q&A will take place at the end of all presentations. So please do keep your questions coming. Um, for the second part of the session, we're gonna hear from governments and international and regional body representatives on their approach to online sexual exploitation and abuse as a multi-jurisdictional problem and their perspective on the needs for international standards. So first up, we have His Excellency Ambassador Mitch Fifil. Is He's Australia's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations who took his posting in New York in October of 2019. Ambassador Fifield is a former Australian Senator and cabinet minister 
during the 15 years in the Australian Parliament. Ambassador Fifield's appointments included Deputy Leader of the Government in the Senate, Manager of the Government Business in the Senate, Minister for Communications, Minister for the Arts, Minister Assisting Prime Minister for Digital Government, uh, and Minister for Responsible, Responsible for Disabilities and Aged Care. Ambassador Fifield will share Australia's approach to online, online sexual exploitation and abuse as a gendered and multi-jurisdictional problem, including its legal framework and the role of the e-safety commissioner, as well as Australia's response to this need for international standards. Over to you, Ambassador. Uh, thanks very much, Carolina and uh, colleagues. Uh, good morning. Uh, and uh, thank you so much to uh, Equality Now for organising uh, today's forum. Um, as, uh, as other speakers uh, have made very clear, uh, the COVID pandemic has really forced all of us to spend more and more time online, far more time online than we would like. Uh, we work more online, uh, we socialise more online, uh, we do more recreation online, uh, kids study more online, and uh, that can be okay, uh, but it does come with real risks. Uh, more time online has opened all of us up to uh, risks of online dangers. And sadly, uh, as uh, the online environment evolves, uh, so do the ways that people can hurt each other. Uh, and there are particular harms, and uh, we've already uh, touched on some of them, that particularly uh, will affect uh, women and girls, uh, online assault, sexual harassment, stalking, uh, the non-consensual sharing of uh, intimate images. Uh, and the horrible reality is that uh, creeps, bullies and perpetrators of violence will now often avail themselves of uh, the anonymity uh, and the new options afforded to them by the online environment. Uh, so for Australia, uh, the uh, safety of uh, women and girls in the physical world uh, and online is a priority. And uh, as you mentioned in, uh, in my previous life, I uh, was the Australian Government Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety uh, and the media. Uh, so uh, I saw uh, some of these impacts and I had the carriage uh, of the government's online response. And just in terms of the overall context, I've, I've got to say, um, I think five, eight, ten years ago, uh, the online space was seen as cool. Uh, it was seen as libertarian. Uh, it was viewed as a place that was ungoverned, but benign. And uh, the tech platforms themselves were seen as hip and well-meaning and untouchable. Uh, the view of the community globally, and certainly in Australia, uh, has changed dramatically. Uh, the view of government uh, has changed uh, around the world, and that's absolutely the, the case in Australia. Uh, and our message in Australia is pretty straightforward. Uh, it is that the rules, the laws, the norms, the standards that apply to behaviour and to conduct in the physical world should also apply in the online world. So our response uh, domestically has uh, been to combine um, education and awareness, uh, survivor support, funding and legislation uh, to uh, the issue of uh, tech facilitated abuse. And the anchor, uh, which you mentioned uh, for our support was the establishment of, of a world first statutory office. Uh, and that's uh, the Australian eSafety Commissioner in 2014. Effectively, uh, an online cop on the beat, uh, a one-stop shop for compliance, for advice, for education uh, and support. Uh, and it was really important to give our e-safety commissioner legislative teeth. And I'll just give you two quick examples. Uh, the first is the scourge of cyberbullying of kids. Uh, we wanted to do something about it. Uh, so we legislated um, a kid cyberbullying material takedown regime. Uh, so if uh, a kid was being cyber bullied, uh, we gave our eSafety Commissioner the legislative power to direct the platforms to take that material down uh, and to issue what are called end user notices to the perpetrators to, to cease and desist. Uh, and if a tech platform doesn't take the material down uh, in the designated time frame, uh, then that tech platform uh, can be fined. 
so uh, you can take action to hold tech platforms accountable within your own jurisdictions. Uh, and it's important to do that where you can. Um, and what we found is by virtue of legislating, there's been essentially a 100% compliance rate uh, by the tech platforms taking the material down when asked to do so. Uh, the second example is uh, the issue of the, the non-consensual sharing of intimate images. Uh, we've introduced, legislated again, to give our eSafety Commissioner the power, uh, a civil penalties regime, uh, so that uh, the eSafety Commissioner can direct websites, hosting providers, social media services, uh, to pull that material down again within a designated time frame. Uh, could also uh, uh, issue cease and desist notices to perpetrators. Uh, but not only do we have a civil penalties regime of fines for the companies, uh, we uh, have also uh, introduced uh, criminal penalties to create a specific criminal provision for the non-consensual sharing of intimate images. So if you share intimate images uh, without consent, uh, you can go to jail. Uh, not only can you be fined, but you can go to jail, a specific offence. Uh, so uh, we think it's important to give these sorts of bodies the legislative teeth that they need. Uh, and our safety commissioner um, also does uh, some, some very practical things, uh, provides tech advice to women experiencing domestic violence, uh, advice to parents uh, on how to keep their kids safe online, uh, and also has responsibility for the full range of uh, prohibited materials. Uh, this office is also continually evolving. Uh, so after Christchurch, uh, we uh, introduced legislation to give again our eSafety Commissioner the power to direct social media platforms to immediately remove and stop streaming um, uh, live content uh, of terrorist acts. And again, uh, this is a, a new step. Uh, the legislation gives the power to hold individuals in tech companies uh, legally liable. Uh, and again, uh, there are fines uh, and potential jail time. Um, so that's a big part of what we do, but we also have a, a whole of government um, approach uh, to uh, the issue of violence against women and children. Um, so we have the national plan to reduce violence against women and children. Uh, it brings together government community um, to prevent uh, family domestic sexual violence. And a core part of that is the work of our eSafety Commissioner. Um, we describe it as a, as a full court press uh, to help identify, um, help people to identify, to report uh, and to protect themselves uh, and their kids from uh, tech facilitated abuse. Uh, this also importantly, uh, as a former Minister for Disabilities as well, um, includes support for frontline workers, uh, disability advocates and specialists uh, who provide support to women uh, with intellectual or cognitive uh, impairments. Uh, we also have evidence-based training and resources to support uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, uh, plus research with particular focus on the experiences of women in regional and remote areas. But uh, we know that we have to keep doing better. Uh, so the government is working on a new Online Safety Act uh, that will bring together all elements of our approach. Uh, it will identify gaps and it will improve industry accountability. And I think industry accountability has probably been one of the most underdone aspects here. Uh, I'm talking about uh, tech platforms, digital platforms. and. Uh, what we've found is when you seek to hold uh, these platforms accountable, the first thing they will say is, we're not accountable, we're not responsible, we're not a publisher, uh, we don't bear any responsibility for what appears on our platform. That's the first thing that they'll say. Then when you start talking about uh, legislating uh, accountability, uh, you will find resistance. And sometimes these platforms will threaten to leave your country, uh, which we, uh, uh, let go through to the keeper. Uh, and then when we legislate, uh, what we find is um, legislating changes the behaviour of these tech platforms. Um, it makes them accountable. Uh, and so there, there doesn't usually uh, tend to be the need to resort to use the legislation because having the legislation there has changed the behaviour of, uh, of the platforms. Now, just a couple of other quick, quick things uh, that we're doing on a, on a broader uh, level. Uh, we also um, have as part of our approach 
the establishment of the Australian Centre to counter child exploitation. Uh, it's led by our Australian Federal Police. Uh, it coordinates uh, nationally with law enforcement, government, non-government, private in industry uh, to target those uh, exploiting children. Uh, it works to better educate kids and parents about how to stay safe. Uh, and uh, more than 21,000 reports, sadly, were received last year by the centre relating to child abuse material. Uh, each uh, each uh, report can contain hundreds and thousands of uh, images. And this is emotionally um, and uh, mentally taxing work for these staff. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, and our federal police charged a total of 191 people uh, with several thousand um, child abuse related offences in 2020, uh, which is uh, up. Uh, from the previous year. Uh, being up is bad, but hopefully that means more people have been caught uh, and, and prosecuted. Uh, and just finally, um, regionally, it's also important to work. Um, so we uh, support um, efforts to prevent the online exploitation of children in the Pacific uh, through a partnership with our eSafety Commissioner. Uh, we develop online resources and workshops for the region uh, in uh, PNG and Fiji. Uh, we're helping uh, develop a, a national approach to uh, safeguarding. Uh, we also work through Plan International um, in the Solomon Islands to uh, protect youth and their families from online risks. Uh, and we also take part in a, in a great thing, uh, the site, what's called Cyber Safety Pacifica, uh, which includes um, a training of police officers across the Pacific uh, so that they can present uh, online safety skills. Um, and and just, to, just in conclusion, um, uh, it's important to work locally, regionally and nationally. So I guess my message is um, just one of these approaches alone will not do. Uh, it's a global issue. It's a multi-jurisdictional issue. Uh, it requires um, global harnessing of efforts and we have good international coordination between police and online safety authorities, but there's also an important role for UN mechanisms, including treaty bodies and special procedures uh, to play in the current environment. Um, civil society organisations, uh, the international community, um, we know have a critical role to play in COVID response, making sure that uh, the rights of women and girls are protected in advance, that they don't go backwards. Uh, treaty bodies uh, have succeeded in carving out an important role within the broader UN human rights architecture. And uh, evidence shows that the treaty system has had enormous impact on the protection of human rights on the ground, uh, in particular uh, through the incorporation of treaty norms into domestic law. Uh, and this includes the Committee on the Rights of uh, the Child's general comment on the digital environment uh, and CEDAW's recommendations on digital technology uh, and the trafficking of women and girls. So we need a, a full court press. Uh, this is a significant barrier to gender equality. Uh, we also, and we've barely touched it, uh, have to address the underlying causes of the abuse, not just the methods uh, of abuse, but the underlying causes. Uh, so uh, the work goes on. Um, got to work internationally, uh, regionally and locally. Uh, and uh, yeah, really, really, uh, keen to continue to work together uh, so that we can advance the rights of women and, and girls online and offline and stop this abominable stuff that happens. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for that, those very insightful comments um, and, and for highlighting the fact that there is need for action at a local, regional and international level um, and, and true cooperation across a range of different stakeholders. Um, and, and thank you for, to Australia for being at the vanguard of, of a lot of these um, important measures uh, to ensure protection of victims. Um, looking forward to speaking more about that. I know that there have been a few questions that have come through. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted now to introduce our, our next speaker, Her Excellency Ambassador Katri Vinica, who holds a position of Ambassador for Gender Equality at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland since September of 2018. Before that, she was Ambassador of Finland uh, to the Kingdom of the Netherlands and permanent representative of Finland to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons from 2015 to 2018. Earlier, Ambassador Vinica served as Director for the United Nations and General Global Affairs at the Political Department of the Finnish MFA from 2010 to 2015. 
Ambassador Benega will share Finland's approach to online sexual exploitation and abuse and the opportunities that Finland sees at the international level, particularly with regard to the need for a global response through adoption of international standards. Over to you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, good morning to New York. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's uh, late afternoon here in, uh, in Helsinki. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on, on this very important uh, issue. Uh, and uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to congratulate uh, Equality Now for, for the very important uh, work you are doing uh, in advancing the rights of uh, women and girls. And to those who don't know, uh, I would like to remind that uh, Equality Now uh, is the winner of the International Gender Equality Prize uh, launched by, by Finland, uh, the winner in uh, 2019. So congratulations for that again from from my government. Uh, well, I want to take up an example, uh, uh, recently rela uh, released a report uh, of the NATO Strategic uh, Communications Center of Excellence showed that uh, the government of Finland, in which all the party leaders are women, is overwhelmingly uh, targeted by online harassment. Uh, during the monitoring period, the five most targeted ministers, all women, faced uh, misogynic uh, abuse, questioning their values, decision-making skills and uh, leadership abilities. Of course, harassment is not the same as sexual abuse, but I still uh, want, want to raise this alarming fact here because it's related uh, to the same phenomenon uh, online and tech-facilitated gender-based violence. Uh, as has been uh, mentioned already a couple of times here, uh, uh, the outbreak of the uh, COVID pandemic has had a serious impact on uh, gender-based uh, violence and, and of course uh, more, much more activities, uh, including education, are now conducted uh, online and children and young persons are spending more time without uh, supervision, uh, with a risk of uh, online uh, exploitation and abuse. And uh, as, as, as we know, uh, we are facing what uh, the UN Secretary General has called a shadow pandemic of gender-based violence. And as, as we have uh, already heard, uh, international standards uh, are, are crucial. Uh, they, are, they are lacking. Uh, they are crucial to prevent and address the scourge of uh, online uh, uh, exploitation and abuse. But it's also important to keep in mind that we have to address uh, the root causes. Uh, online sexual exploitation and abuse are a form of gender-based violence, which has its roots uh, on structural discrimination and gender inequality. Transformative and sustainable change uh, requires gender equality and non-discrimination. And violence and abuse uh, is actually not a new phenomenon, but it's, it's an extension of uh, existing discrimination uh, offline. So what is uh, illegal uh, offline is also illegal online. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Shame, fear and re-victimization by authorities and possible retaliation from perpetrators make that many, many cases of uh, sexual exploitation and abuse uh, remain unreported. It's therefore important that there are accessible and safe reporting mechanisms for those who face online sexual exploitation and abuse. Another key aspect, of course, is support to victims and survivors. And special attention must be paid to women and girls facing intersecting and multiple forms of discrimination, including women and girls with disabilities, uh, those belonging to sexual and ethnic minorities and others. They are at high risk of gender-based violence, including online sexual exploitation and abuse. But as important as having standards is their implementation. Successful implementation requires political commitment, awareness raising among relevant authorities 
such as law enforcement, judiciary, media and general public. It also requires necessary financial, technical and human resources, uh, training and funding, law enforcement uh, to better understand this issue is uh, really of crucial importance. And it's also important that uh, existing international, regional and national instruments and legislation integrate as much as possible measures to prevent and eliminate online sexual exploitation and abuse. And of course, uh, a very important instrument in this respect is the Council of Europe uh, Istanbul Convention. Uh, Grevio, the independent group of experts, is working on an interpretation of the Istanbul Convention in relation to digital expressions of violence against women, uh, such as image-based abuse, sexual harassment and threats online and sexist hate speech. Uh, this is particularly relevant to women in politics. This will be available at the end of this year and will offer very helpful guidance. And Finland is really a very staunch supporter of the uh, Council of Europe Istanbul Convention and uh, I would like to remind that it's it's open for uh, for all all countries not not only those uh, in in Europe and of course uh, I would also like to take this uh, opportunity of uh, expressing our disappointment now that uh, an important uh, member state I mean uh, state belongs to, to the convention Turkey has announced uh, its intention to leave leave the con convention, which is uh, yet another uh, sign of, uh, I would say, anti-gender movement that we are facing at the moment. Well, of course, uh, private sector uh, actors are, are key in preventing and eliminating online sexual exploitation and abuse. Uh, but uh, present self-regulation clearly is not sufficient and more measures should be taken uh, by the private sector to enforce self-regulatory codes and significantly increase the level of transparency and accountability. Uh, then I would uh, like to uh, uh, raise a campaign or process that we consider very important at the moment. Uh, and this is uh, the so-called generation equality uh, process, which has been launched by UN Women, uh, France and Mexico, actually to celebrate uh, what was intended to be the super year of uh, gender equality uh, 20, 2020. But of course, uh, the agenda was uh, changed uh, and, and the meetings were postponed to this year. But anyhow, it's, it's a five-year uh, five uh, long, long process. And Finland is co-chairing uh, uh, an action coalition called uh, Technology and Innovation for Gender Equality. And, and one of the, uh, uh, the main actions uh, uh, defined uh, is, is tackling uh, uh, online gender-based uh, violence. So, so this uh, topic is uh, at the very heart, uh, heart of, uh, of, of this, this process and uh, Finland will be uh, mobilizing international support for this uh, for this action and uh, i would like to uh, invite uh, all all of you those those who can uh, uh, commit uh, commit uh, to these uh, objectives uh, uh, to to join join the process it will be officially launched uh, in in mexico uh, uh, next next week uh, uh, and anybody can become a so-called commitment uh, maker. Well, in in Mexico, virtually, as as we all all know. And finally, uh, I would like to uh, mention uh, the role of the European Union, uh, which uh, strives to become a global leader in uh, human-centric uh, digital transformation. Uh, and the EU's recently published uh, digital services. Act uh, uh, contains uh, proposals uh, which I think we may have lost.
connection with Ambassador Vinica. Ambassador Vinica, can you hear me? I believe not. So we'll. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, support. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, Ambassador Vinica, we, we lost you there for the last probably 30 seconds. Would you mind repeating your final remarks? Um, uh, so, sorry, sorry, my uh, connection is a little bit bad. Uh, yes, uh, so so Finland uh, is really looking forward uh, to these new uh, EU level regulations and, and we hope that uh, this might be a model also for, for the international level in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and thank you for identifying those concrete action items um, that are available to us now as we pursue some of these uh, more international and joined up um, standards. So it, it's been a pleasure and I'm, I'm delighted to turn it now over to our next speaker, Mr. Elias Chatsis, who joined the UN in 2006 working on terrorism prevention and anti-organized crime. Since 2012, he's been leading the UNODC's section against human trafficking and migrant smuggling. And prior to joining the United Nations, Mr. Chatsis served in senior positions in regional organizations in Southeastern Europe, dealing with war crimes and organized crime. Um, Mr. Chatsis is going to share with us global trends in online human trafficking for sexual exploitation, gaps and opportunities in international trafficking frameworks um, in the context of this conversation. Over to you, Mr. Chatsis. Thank you, Carolina, for giving me the floor and thank you for the invitation today to speak at this event. In the past 20 years, modern communication technologies have entered every sphere of human life and brought us closer than ever. The fast internet, smartphones, communication applications, social media, free camera and video software give us opportunities to connect that were pre previously unimaginable. But with every technological advance, as we heard, there are also dangers lurking. Criminals have been quick to adapt and to integrate technology into their operations, especially for human trafficking from the seeking, recruitment, and exploitation of victims to the transfer and laundering of the illicit profits of their crime. We're also extremely concerned for, that the abuse of these technologies by criminals is increasing further during the COVID pandemic. People of all ages and backgrounds are spending more time online, especially children, on social media, online gaming platforms, and also dating applications. Technology though is a double-edged sword. It can also be used to prevent crime, to provide intelligence and evidence to investigators and prosecutors and prosecutors, and to help identify victims of trafficking persons. In my intervention today, as you said, I will focus on both the negative, but also the positive influence of technology, and will outline the opportunities offered by the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and its human trafficking protocols to address online human trafficking. In February, 2021, just a little more than a month ago, UNODC published this biennial report on trafficking in persons. In view of the increasing relevance of communication technologies, the report dedicated a whole chapter to how human traffickers use the internet as what we call a digital hunting ground. The findings are based on a meticulous review of all cases that member states shared with us since 2009. While the use of technology in trafficking was the exception 10 years ago, the report shows that traffickers have integrated internet technologies in their business model. And just as an example, in Latin America, a regional network of prosecutors that we're working with has identified that between May and July 2020, almost 60% of all trafficking cases involved some form of electronic means for the recruitment of children. Criminals can approach potential victims online with promise of a job or an emotional attachment deceive them and exploit them in real life. They may use the internet to advertise the victim services. They have also created new ways of doing business entirely online. For example, sexual exploitation over webcam and live streaming, which poses tremendous challenges in, in, in international cooperation. Victims are exploited in one location, but users may be anywhere around the world and, it, and, 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 and in any time zone. Traffickers, can now address global markets without having to transport and transfer victims across state boundaries. Images can be used, reused over and over again and perpetually. Traditional methods of judicial cooperation between countries have become too slow to respond to the speed and amount of information served with such wide audience. 
In one case, it's presented in the UNHC Global Report, four, female, four male traffickers organized and managed what we call the cybersex den to exploit victims through coerced performances in front of webcams. The performances were live streamed, reaching paid customers all over the world. UNODC reviewed many cases of traffickers who coerced victims into establishing rapport with users in chat rooms that were monitored by the traffickers. And there is ample evidence of the growth of child sexual abuse material online, of which some is related to trafficking persons. Through the internet, traffickers easily gain access to, the increase, to an increased pool of customers, particularly sex buyers. One court case showed that a single trafficker working alone managed to sexually exploit and connect one victim with over 100 sex buyers over a period of 60 days using online advertisement. Despite its frequent misuse though, technology can be also an important asset to law enforcement. It can aid investigations, enhance prosecutions, raise awareness, provide services to victims, and shed new light on the makeup of and operations of trafficking networks. It can also be used to trace the illicit assets gathered by the traffickers. A number of initiatives have already been launched around the world to take advantage of technology to fight human trafficking. Tech Against Trafficking is a coalition of technology companies working together. It has mapped more than 260 technology tools that support anti-trafficking work. Visual processing and facial recognition software, software can be used in web crawling to search for photos and videos of victims who are trafficked for sexual exploitation. Chatbots and artificial intelligence can be utilized to engage in conversations simultaneously with thousands of people who may want to report cases or with potential victims. So-called data mining tools can search the internet for illegal trafficking content. Today, technology can also facilitate the recording, the storage, the analysis, and the exchange of vast amount of information relating to human trafficking. Technologies are also already used to shield victims or witnesses from visual contact with the traffickers in court or to facilitate the social reintegration. The new online environment for human trafficking and sexual exploitation poses significant challenges for the investigation and the prosecution of the crime and for the protection of the victims. Fortunately, there are international legal instruments that, can, that are flexible enough to be applied in these circumstances and can provide some of the re responses required. And I'm referring here to the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and its additional protocol on human trafficking. These instruments have reached almost universal ratification and have extensive provisions on international cooperation in criminal matters, including on mutual legal assistance, on what we called a mini treaty within a treaty. Under Article 2B of the convention, any serious crime with a penalty of four years of imprisonment or more can be included under the convention. And this can also be included, to, can be used to cover online crimes. And it is important to mention that many countries already report uh, a wide use uh, of the application of these provisions on the, of the convention for cases uh, where internet has been used to commit crimes. At the same time, Article 3 of the, of the Human Trafficking Protocol allows new purposes of exploitation to be added to the definition of the crime, which also can include online sexual exploitation. And many countries around the world have already included such provision in the national legislation. The challenges involved in international cooperation and electronic evidence are reviewed and debated by member states in different UN fora. A workshop at this month's UN Crime Congress focused on modern technologies and crime. At the same time, UN members decided to establish an ad hoc committee of experts to negotiate a new international convention on countering the use of information and communication technologies for criminal purposes. The scope of such, of, of such an instrument, which could also include online abuse and exploitation of children, is going to be the focus of discussions that are starting later this year. At the operational level, UNODC continues to work with countries, with civil society, and with the private sector to create a better understanding of the problem and to strengthen the capacity to address, to address it. In 2020, we launched a project fostering, focusing on fostering public-private partnerships to address trafficking in persons. And the compendium of, of global practice will be published later this year. And since 2018, we support technology, technology companies such as IBM and NGOs to run global events 
where college students and young professionals develop tools that use both technology and data analysis that could be helpful in anti-trafficking efforts. Today, it will be hard to find a human trafficking case, especially when it relates to sexual exploitation that does not involve some form of modern communication technology. An effective response requires governments to match the technological advancements of the criminals in a proportional, legal, accountable, and necessary manner. As fast internet is moving to developing countries, traffickers will have access to vast vulnerable populations. And where national authorities may not be prepared to prevent and combat a crime, which may be occurring in a new online environment. Future success in eradicating human trafficking in its many forms will depend on how countries and societies are prepared for and equipped to harness technology in their responses. Thanks for giving me the floor, Carly. Thank you, Mr. Chatsitz. That was, that was really fantastic. And I think it, it highlights the importance of leveraging technology to combat trafficking and online sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, thank you for that. Um, so last but certainly not least, um, I'm delighted to turn it over to Ali Vandenbrink, our last speaker. So over the past 40 years, Ali has dedicated her professional life to governing various institutions committed to combating domestic violence against women and children, and also men. She was formerly the CEO of Bleach Group, an Amsterdam-based organization aimed at the prevention of violence against women and domestic violence in general. She's now the honorable member of Grevio, the group of experts on action against violence against women and domestic violence since September of 2018. Grevio is an independent expert body responsible for monitoring the implementation of the Council of Europe's Convention on Prevention and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence or the Istanbul Convention. Ali will share with us more on Grevio's work in this area and its perspective on addressing online sexual exploitation and abuse as well as approaches to balancing digital rights and protection from online sexual harms. Over to you, Ali. Unmute. Thank you, uh, Carolina, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, organizers, for inviting uh, Gravio. Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening in Australia. I don't know what time schedule is. It's the other, the other day, <laughs> the other time of the day, just around the corner. Maybe uh, not all of you are familiar with the mandate of Gravio or with the Istanbul Convention. Uh, so let me start with some explanation. The Istanbul Convention is an instrument of the Council of Europe. It is the Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. It was adopted almost 10 years ago in Istanbul and called the Istanbul Convention. It has been ratified by 34 countries. Well, thank you, uh, Ambassador Vinica, for your support for the Istanbul Convention, your strong support. And you also mentioned uh, that sadly, uh, just last Saturday, President Erdogan of Turkey has announced the withdrawal of the Convention by Turkey despite all the efforts of women's organizations and others. Well, as we know, uh, well, the fight against violence against women isn't over yet, and that also applies for Europe. But we are really strongly convinced to, to fight back and to fight further on. The Convention has set up a strong monitoring mechanism to assess the implementation. And you already said, Carolina, that mechanism consists of two pillars, the group of experts on action, the Gravio group as an independent monitoring body, and the committee of the parties composed of the official representatives of the state parties of the convention. I'm honored to be a member of Gravio and to take part in that process. Gravio's task is to draw up and publish reports with a baseline evaluation on a country by country basis. And so far in the last three years, 17 reports have been adopted. There are positive signs that this system is working. Gravio gets very positive feedback from states that say that they can make good use of Gravio's recommendations to a better implementation. Well, the convention covers all forms of violence against women, whether happening in real life, online, or via tech facilitated tools. These forms should be viewed as a continuum 
and the expression of the same phenomenon, namely gender-based violence. Gravio addresses all these forms of violence, therefore, as a gendered issue. Given this continuum, online and offline violence gave, on one hand, rise to similar challenges in the area of awareness raising, data collection, protection and criminal investigation. Like any other form of violence against women, online violence is often overlooked because of the lack of awareness and gendered understanding of this violence. Victims' experiences are considered as isolated incidents rather than patterns, and we see a lot of victim blaming. A comprehensive response requires following a holistic approach covering all forms of violence that are foreseen in the Convention. It also requires the coordinated and multi-agency approach across the main four pillars of the Conventions, the pillars of prevention, protection, prosecution, and integrated policies. We have seen the need to pay full attention to the more and more emerging and new forms of violence in the digital sphere. So we decided to create our first general recommendation on the digital dimension of violence against women and domestic violence. As one of the members of Gravio's working group for this recommendation, we realize ourselves better and better the specific aspects we face, the factors of quick dispersion and acceleration, imitation of violent behavior in bigger groups on a previous unknown scale, the boundaries between private and public life that are blurring, the fact that it isn't easy and sometimes nearly impossible to remove the online communications and, of course, the role of the international operating social platforms and tech companies. We already heard a lot of about it this, in this session. We will uh, classify the dig digital forms in the existing three categories of the Convention, namely online sexual harassment, online and technology facilitated stalking, and the third one, the digital dimensions of psychological violence. In this way, we will include online forms in our existing categories, where we will connect the digital and the non-digital components and consider this as an opportunity to strengthen the already existing implementation processes in all the 34 countries. We will address the states with concrete recommendations, such as to include digital literacy and online safety in formal curricula, to enlarge the digital expertise acquired by women's specialist support services and offer them resources to offer holistic services, including legal and technical advice on the removal of harmful content and to take measures to put an end to the impunity for digital acts of violence against women by encouraging the responsibility of the actors, including the ICT companies and media platforms, in particular through robust content moderation and removal and simplified access to evidence. These are a few examples of our recommendations. Of course, we will face challenges ahead of us. We will address the states and encourage them to address the platforms and companies. We have concerns about the lack of resources for women's specialist services in a lot of European countries. Prosecution of perpetrators suffers from lack of possibilities because of the multi-jurisdictional world we're living in. At the moment, we are in the process of formulating useful recommendations in this area. This is our contribution to the big issues we are talking about. We realize we cannot solve all problems of issues of, or all tensions between the digital rights and safety, but we can contribute by connecting the online and offline world and uh, all the uh, pillars of the convention. And if you ask, you asked me, is gender-based violence a global issue? Yes, of course it is. When it comes to the desired global standards, we think the Istanbul Convention is a global standard. And as already Ambassador Vinica said, it's open for ratification and accession on a global level, or states can relate to it as a source of inspiration. 
I think it's also relevant to mention one of the other relevant instruments of the Council of Europe, the Lanzarote Convention, the Convention on Protection of Children Against Sexual Exploitation and Sexual Abuse. The fact that the Istanbul Convention is a global tool is of course valid also with regard to the Lanzarote Convention. As regards online sexual exploitation and abuse, the Lanzarote Committee adopted an interpreted interpretative opinion in May 2017 that makes it clear that in implementing the Lanzarote Convention, parties should ensure appropriate responses to technological developments and use of all relevant tools, measures and strategies to effectively prevent and combat sexual offenses against children, which are facilitated through the use of ICTs. Should we prioritize the work on a new global instrument? At this time, the considerations of Gravio are development of new instruments would probably entail the risk of bringing about conflicting treaty obligations or result in diluting existing standards. We also have serious concerns about the current political arena, as we already talked about Turkey. And it could add to states parties monitoring fatigue. The implementation of existing standards is therefore for Gravio our primary focus. We realize that there are still big gaps to fill and of course Gravio welcomes the process of cross fertilization and is a supporter of the role of the platform of independent United Nations and regional expert mechanisms on violence against women and women's rights. Finally, we are very curious to receive the full report to use it for a follow-up that it's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. Um, that's, that's really great to hear and specifically identifying um, ways in which governments and other actors can, can begin to engage with existing international frameworks. Um, and, and like you, I think we're all excited to see some of the resources that have been shared today um, come to life and, and be circulated more widely within this community. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted now to turn it over to our audience who have been patiently waiting to ask their questions. So I'm gonna start surfacing some of those questions and, and um, passing them on to all of you. Um, so first up, um, I'd like to share a question um, that takes us in a slightly different direction um, to thinking beyond the conversation and the scope that we've had so far. Um, so the question is, in preparing for this webinar, were you able to look into how transgender and gender non-conforming folk are affected by online exploitation and abuse. The LGBTQ plus community faces extreme rates of violence offline. And I would be interested in seeing how that translates into this conversation. Who would like to take that one? Carly, I'm trying to find a way to raise my hand, but I don't seem to be able to. Please go ahead, jump right in. Can I? Sorry, thank you. Uh, no, it, it's, it's a very pertinent question, and it's an, it's a it's it's a group that has been uh, quite at the focus of, of of a lot of our work. We will be working on a, on a data jam in in June in Canada with the community to look, uh, you know, at possible solutions. Uh, to this and also to 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 have a better understanding of 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 the uh, of of the challenges that, that they are facing, but this is a community that it's 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 um, it, it's not has been in the focus until now on on a lot of this work, but a community that's extremely vulnerable and has been a lot of times the target of of uh, of, of attacks over the internet and and also a, it has been also for us a subject of specific review that we're doing. On their vulnerability to trafficking in persons. And this has been included also in the last global report that we have issued. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Does anybody else want to take that question as well? Or shall we move on to the next one? Okay, uh, we look forward to, to hearing more about that work, Mr. Chatsis. That's, um, it'll be interesting to think about an ongoing conversation, including some of the findings uh, from that work. Um, thank you for whoever shared that question. Um, this one, this next question is for Ambassador Fifield uh, regarding corporate liability for illegal sharing of images online. The specific question is which individuals in a corporation platform will the Australian legislation target and what difficulties do you see, if any, in holding them properly accountable under the legislation? Uh, th thanks for that. Um, look, in terms of our kids' cyberbullying 
takedown regime and also the uh, non-consensual sharing of intimate images uh, takedown regime, uh, the fines that are um, on the statute books uh, apply to the corporation um, rather than to an individual. Uh, so that's fairly straightforward. Uh, where it's a bit different is uh, when it comes to um, our regime requiring internet service providers to take down material um, that is uh, uh, the live streaming of uh, violent terrorist extremism. Uh, in that case, uh, we, we do have uh, provisions to uh, hold individuals in those companies accountable. And, and just very, very briefly, uh, how, how this works is firstly, we have a protocol uh, that's been agreed. Uh, between uh, government and the platforms, and, and that is if there is uh, a designated um, online crisis event, uh, then uh, the internet service providers are required uh, to follow the eSafety e Commissioner's direction to block access to a website that's hosting uh, graphic material that depicts a terrorist act. Um, uh, we also have, separate to that protocol, uh, in legislation, uh, a criminal uh, offence for a social media platform uh, to not remove um, abhorrent violent terrorist material when directed to. Uh, and there, uh, there's on the statute books, uh, fines of up to 10% of a platform's annual turnover. Uh, and there's also up to three years imprisonment uh, for a, a relevant designated uh, office holder uh, in that particular company. So um, in, in, in one case, the first I mentioned, uh, it's fining uh, the, the company itself, uh, but in the case of this uh, violent terrorist material, uh, it's an in individual office holder that, uh, that would be held to account. Thank you for that, Ambassador. Um, the next question we have is open. So what is the role of social media platforms in helping curb online sexual exploitation and abuse? Is it possible for organizations to lobby for a toll-free emergency line for these online platforms to report abuse and exploitation? Who would like to take that one? Mr. Chatsis, I may turn this back over to you because I think the question that relates to the role of social media platforms um, might dovetail with some of the references you were making to using technology um, and um, and how we might leverage that to combat this crime. So perhaps you could speak to this. Thank you. I don't know if I have the a direct answer to the, uh, to the question, but what I can say is that one of the challenges that we're all facing is how to bring, you know, the, uh, these tech companies into the, not only to this discussion, but also into the solution and how to engage with them. And at this stage, what we have to do is basically engage with them because there's no overall framework with where this cooperation can happen. Uh, there is a, a willingness from tech companies to, uh, to work on this. And I guess this includes also, uh, I don't have specific information on, on, on social media platforms, but we're working with some of them on different aspects of trafficking in persons, not on online sexual exploitation, but on, on, on various aspects that are they're, they're very forthcoming. I don't know what would be the practicality of establishing a toll free uh, sort of helpline for everyone, it may be possible to do in a, in a national setting. At the international level, I think it may be a bit technically challenging uh, to, uh, to do. Thank you. I don't know, I don't think I have answered directly, but Ambassador has raised his hands. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you. Um, I, I, I take uh, the question to be uh, suggesting that some of the platforms take greater responsibility uh, and that uh, these platforms should establish uh, toll-free numbers that people can phone and advise that uh, your, uh, your, your service uh, is uh, hosting abuse, is facilitating abuse. Uh, I think the more transparency there is uh, on the part of uh, these platforms, uh, the better, the more accountability, the better. Uh, the more these platforms publicly report uh, the range of abuses uh, and the, the number of abuses uh, and uh, do that uh, year by year. Uh, so hopefully uh, we can see that there's a trend down, that they are taking action, that they are removing this material. Uh, but what would assist them, uh, I think, is having uh, 
easier access uh, for um, members of the community who have problems to phone them and to make contact. I think the experience that all of us have had is that it's it's almost impossible to actually uh, get onto these tech platforms sometimes. You know, how do you actually get in contact with a, with a human being in these tech platforms? They've, they've got to make it easier. And can I say, that's also been an issue for law enforcement at times, is actually talking to a human being on one of these platforms uh, and b someone who actually has a capacity to take a decision because often these platforms will only have one person in, in a particular country uh, and you know the person who can make a decision is on the other side of the world in a different time zone and you know it doesn't wake up till the, you know the morning their time so i think platforms really need to make uh make it much more straightforward for for the community and for relevant authorities to, to get in touch um and, and just uh, going back to, to uh, the first question um, uh, about LGBTIQ uh, and the issues that uh, uh, individuals face, um, uh, I, can I just suggest as, as something that might be useful uh, is visiting the website of our uh, eSafety Commissioner, uh, which is uh, eSafety.gov.au, uh, where there is a section on uh, online safety advice and support uh, for LGBTIQ uh, um, uh, folk uh, and some of the things that they can do to uh, protect themselves and some of the avenues that uh, there are there for support. Uh, and our eSafety Commissioner uh, does uh, commission uh, research often uh, into uh, different segments of the community to see uh, what are the particular challenges that they're facing. Cheers. That's great. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, let's see. Our next question is directed at um, Ambassador Vinica, um, and it inquires, is the Finnish government planning action to tackle the worrying trend of online abuse against women in politics? Has this trend also been identified at local and regional levels? Uh, thank you for that very uh, pertinent uh, question. Uh, actually, I, I forgot to mention uh, in my introduction that uh, that the Finnish government has just uh, recently adopted an uh, action plan uh, for combating violence against women and this action plan uh, also also contains uh, what is called uh, digital violence uh, so so we, we aim at uh, improving our our capacity uh, in, in tackling this uh, but uh, let me say that uh, I think it's it's very saddening that uh, that these kind of issues are, are really limiting women's political participation at the moment, because we see uh, the phenomenon that uh, that women are not uh, uh, willing to to run as candidates. We are we are going to have municipal elections uh, soon. Actually, they were uh, supposed to be in, in April, but due to the uh, COVID situation, they have been postponed uh, to June. And it seems that uh, that uh, these kind of issues are really having an impact. Uh, on, on how how easy it is to find uh, candidates. Well, actually, this affects also also men to to some extent. But I, I think that uh, uh, in in a situation where actually Finland takes proud of uh, being the first country in the world uh, to give full political rights to women as early as 19, 1906, uh, it's uh, it's it's really uh, shocking that. Uh, that we are in, in this kind of situation, but uh, but I, I don't think this is in anything uh, spe specific for Finland as as such. I mean, this is a global global phenomenon, uh, uh, the misogynic uh, hate speech uh, on, on the web. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, our next question is for Yasmin. So Yasmin, what do you think is our best solution to the conflict on current U.S. obscenity laws? That conflict with the free speech argument. Um, and, and the person notes not only is self regulation not working, but DOJ isn't doing anything actually. So, this is a very good question. Um, currently, our Department of Justice can, um, you know, sue for obscenity. And, and one of the glaring questions that I think the advocacy community has had is why aren't they? pursuing these types of charges, particularly for many of the crimes that we are seeing uh, most recently being discussed around Pornhub. 
um, and the sex trafficking, the child sexual exploitation, uh, and the type of very violent and degrading content that we are seeing on many of these mainstream uh, web platforms. And so I think that's a very good question and one that uh, many of us have been pushing for a long time. Why aren't we bringing obscenity charges? Um, this isn't free speech, right? This isn't expression of art. Um, the, a lot of this is, is hate speech and can be argued as such. It's very uh, misogynistic, it's very degrading, um, and, and some of it could even be characterized as torture. And so that is something that we're looking at. And I think, um, you know, I, I know that some of these questions are, are looking to advocates and, and lawmakers to come up with the solutions, but I think one of the overarching realities is that tech policy is incredibly complicated and it's not necessarily um, my wheelhouse and expertise. And that is why it's so urgent for these tech platforms and these tech minds to come together and be a part of these solutions. Um, and, and if um, they're not willing to come to the table and help craft these solutions to make social media um, respond more appropriately when you know children are being bought and sold live um, to figure out mechanisms for preventing this type of violent content, um, then perhaps it's our responsibility to create greater and more strict accountability mechanisms in order to force their hand. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're not always going to be able to come up with the specific legal or tech solutions, but it's it's urgent that somebody does um, because as as we keep saying, children and, and women um, and the violence that we are experiencing all over the internet is just not an acceptable collateral uh, consequence of free speech or uh, privacy rights and, and something needs to be done about it. Um, and so I, I think this is something that we're gonna continue pushing the Department of Justice to pursue. Um, and it's certainly something that is being talked about more in light of conversations that are being had specifically around Pornhub uh, and the violence that we're seeing in online pornography and some of those websites associated with MindGeek. Thank you for that, Yasmin. Um, and apologies for the crying toddler in the background, the perils of working from home. Um, the, our, our next question is, um, in light of the UN agenda for universal CSE, which I presume means comprehensive sexuality education, which exposes children to sexual activity at an early age, do you see this as putting children at greater risk for online sexual exploitation? This might be a question perhaps for Yasmin or Titi, but anybody that's interested to take it, please feel free to. Apologies, can you repeat that question really quickly? Of course, um, in light of the UN agenda for universal comprehensive sexual education, which exposes children to sexual activity at an early age, do you see this as putting children at greater risk for online sexual exploitation? I mean, Titsi, feel free to chime in. I think for us, we are always um, urging more education um, for, for children to be aware of um, what's happening and, and the risks that um, they're facing. And so I think um, they're not necessarily in contradiction. If anything, we're empowering young people with understanding the risks that they face and understanding the dynamics of um, sexual relationships, uh, you know, sexual consent, um, and then sexual abuse and, and what constitutes abuse and violence. And so um, in our experience, um, empowering young people and, and children um, at young ages to understand these dynamics is, is integral to um, ensuring their safety uh, in, in the future. But again, um, I, I'm curious what, what CC might have to say about that. Yeah, I think I would agree with you, Yasmin, and maybe to also say, you know, as we look at the issue that may, the, the focus, I suppose, should be more on the perpetrators as being responsible for the violence, um, you know, uh, rather than, you know, maybe looking at it as, or, you know, the, the children because um, of one or two, three factors, but that we, you know, continue to look at it as a problem that's coming, you know, that's societal, but that's being perpetrated by, by, by offenders, you know, whoever those may be, yeah. Thank and you if both. I may, oh, if yes, I may, please, I was, go ahead. sorry, sorry, yes. Uh, 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 well, for us, uh, for Finland, uh, comprehensive uh, sexuality uh, education is, is extremely, extremely important. And I, I would like to stress uh, uh, its importance as, as part of uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, which is really key for uh, empowerment of uh, women and women and girls. So I, I, I totally agree with uh, previous 
speakers. Thank you. That's great. And I think that we've we've heard on, in a number of remarks the importance of, of education. So it's great to emphasize it and, and understand, appreciate exactly what the, the scope of this type of education can look like um, and how it can empower potential victims um, and, and those fighting these, these heinous crimes. So shifting gears slightly, talking a little bit more about the, the actual legislation and, and frameworks currently in existence. One person asks, the EU's e-privacy legislation is a bit of a nightmare at the moment as it prevents the use of tech such as photo DNA. The temporary derogation prevents the use of innovative new tech in this area. How can this be resolved? Is this something that you could speak to potentially, Ali? Sorry, but I, I don't think I have the right knowledge to answer this question precisely. I really, I really can't do that. No, I cannot do that. No problem. Does anybody else have any knowledge of this topic? Yeah, yeah there are currently efforts uh, through the We Protect Global Alliance, for instance, to to you know to lobby the, the the relevant authorities within the EU to ensure that it is resolved. Uh, but I think you know, as the question says, it, it, it still remains um, a very sort of important issue that needs attention if companies are not able to to use their, their tools to detect. Uh, but there's a whole, you know, sort of campaign uh, through We Protect Global Alliance that's mobilizing, you know, civil society um, um, towards resolution. Yeah. Thank you, Titi. And I think that's right. There's the, the question that this is to some extent touching on is um, that how we ensure that this legislation is still enabling all the use of all the resources and tools that we have at our disposal both to fight this crime, but also um, um, that are part and parcel of making everybody's um, life easier and, and to ensure um, that we're able to engage with technology in a productive and positive way. Um, another question at that international scale um, is how uh, the country's international cooperation and UN agencies are crossing the agendas of reducing the technology barriers and access to education and work. And, and on the other hand, the increase of online sexual exploitation and abuse. So how are, how are you seeing that intersection of the agenda of, um, of education and reducing technology barriers um, while at the same time seeing this increase in, in online sexual exploitation? Does anybody want to take that? Should I put someone on the spot? <laughs> Let's see, maybe TT with, with some of the, with the, from the perspective of the quality nine, the research that you've been doing, um, do you see um, an opportunity he, here for uh, more alignment in how to reduce these technology barriers and the, the efforts in access to education and work to better serve the, the current trend of trending upwards of online sexual exploitation and abuse. So how do you see that, that the different levels of countries and international bodies collaborating to achieve that? Yeah, and maybe the how is, um, you know, a point uh, for further discussion, but the whole idea of, you know, cooperation and, and, and trying to find linkages, how we can work together, you know, bringing all stakeholders together on different points um, I think in principle is what we should be working more towards uh, because it requires, you know, all stakeholders to, to, to come together, bring in different perspectives and try and address, you know, some of the tensions, if there are any tensions. But I think that can only, you know, sort of happen when, when that cooperation and, and engagement is, is ongoing so people can bring their different perspectives to the table. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Titi. Please go ahead, Ambassador. Sure. Th thanks. I, I think that uh, the, the question was, uh, you know, going going to the issue of, of the, the digital divide that technology has and the technology have nots. What what can be what can be done uh, about that? Um, and I guess you know, what, what, one one thing um, to keep in mind uh, is when looking to expand connectivity, because connectivity 
Wi-Fi, broadband. You know, ten years ago, it was seen as it was seen as a luxury. Um, it's now uh, essential. Uh, you 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 can't do business. Uh, you can't uh, have your full range of, of rights uh, unless you can be connected, uh, and that's uh, that that's a relatively uh, new concept. Um, and COVID has really accelerated the understanding of that because when you're forced to be at home, you're forced to work at home, uh, and you don't have access to being connected, uh, then that that uh, that brings the issue to light, um, like perhaps nothing nothing else could. Uh, I guess the positive side of that is COVID has really accelerated the thinking of governments about how do we make sure that our communities are connected. Uh, and I guess we, we were fortunate in Australia that uh, we had uh, just completed a national broadband network where the government mandated that every premise in the country had to have access to, to fast broadband. We just completed that after a 10 year project um, just prior to COVID, COVID coming. Um, but I guess one of the one of the lessons is for for, for communities for countries is uh, not to be fixated on a particular technology type. Um, to I guess in a sense be technology agnostic to use the technology that makes sense in a given area to see connectivity rolled out fastest and at lowest cost. Um, you know that approach rather than than being focused on a, on a particular technology methodology um, I guess is is one uh, uh, is one lesson um, so yeah sorry just just some just some thoughts uh, but also uh, you know it's important for, for countries to, to work with each other to, to share their experiences of, of how to improve uh, connectivity uh, and uh, uh, because you, you don't want you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel um, there are plenty of countries that have made mistakes in in the uh, in, uh, in what they do, uh, and so uh, best to share our experiences, good and bad. Thank you, Ambassador, and I'm pretty fortunate. If I may. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ambassador. Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, Yes, well, of course, uh, I think that uh, one of the uh, big challenges in, in gender equality today is uh, the gender digital divide, which uh, has to be addressed. And uh, and this is uh, really uh, one of the uh, aims of, of this uh, generation equality uh, process and uh, action coalition on uh, technology and, uh, and innovation. And, uh, uh, really, a multi-stakeholder approach is, is needed. We we need the cooperation of, of governments and uh, big uh, big tech uh, tech companies and, uh, and and the tech companies they really have to be uh, fully fully on board and uh, and 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 we also have to avoid uh, avoid this kind of involvement being any kind of uh, whitewashing for them. I think this is also something that we have to be aware that we really have to. Uh, challenge them uh, to to uh, to practice uh, what is being preached, so to say. Such an important point: the gender-based digital divide. Um, certainly critical to think about in the context of this conversation, but more broadly. Um, thank you both for that. Uh, the last question I have here, um, and I'll, I'll check in to see if you have any additional questions, is uh, upon reading. It appears that the departure of Turkey and Poland from the Istanbul Convention were described as their serious concerns that the ratification of the convention is not in line with global standards in terms of traditional values in marriage and protecting life in the womb. Is there common ground for prevention of violence without disregarding traditional values held by a majority of the world's population? Who would like to take that question? I didn't hear it. Uh, could you repeat it, uh, Carolina? Of course, happy to. So in summary, they're, they're asking, um, they mentioned that the departures from Turkey and Poland from the Istanbul Convention seems to have been, been attributed to the fact that um, they felt that the global standards, um, the convention is not in line with global standards with respect to traditional values on marriage and um, protecting life in the womb. So they're asking if there is a common ground for prevention of violence without disregarding traditional values. Well, I can say in general that the Istanbul Convention isn't threatening traditional life because it's not talking about traditional life. It's only focused on preventing violence 
whoever and whatever you choose to live to live so there are a lot of this is no time to explain it uh, more broadly but there is there these these are really misconceptions and myths about the istanbul convention because the istanbul convention only says well we don't want violence in families however your family or traditional values are but violence is not acceptable Thank you for that clarification. Does anybody else want to address that? Uh, well, yes, I, I can only only fully fully agree what uh, what was uh, what was said uh, by by the previous previous uh, speaker, and uh, and and really we have to adhere to to international human rights uh, standards, and uh, and I think uh, uh, gender equality is 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 part of uh, part of uh, let's say the international human rights. Uh, Okay. You all. Apologies. Muted myself. Um, thank you all very, very much, and thank you to everybody who shared these questions. I'm going to wrap us up now, conscious that we're we're at the end of our time. Um, thank you tremendously to our wonderful panel. Um, they've, as you've heard, highlighted the need for an international framework um, that informs national laws and responses, as well as international cooperation and regulation of digital technology companies. Uh, but as the speaker noted as well, there are actions that governments can take in the framework of the Istanbul Convention and the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, among other international instruments. But our work is far from done. So it's clear that online sexual exploitation is a global and complex problem. And the adoption of international standards is only one of many steps that need to be taken to curb and combat this heinous crime. As you heard, the magnitude of the challenge requires national and local coordination among governments, tech companies, civil society, and survivors. It requires accountability and justice for victims. It requires leveraging technology and digital tools to enhance prevention, protection, and prosecution. It requires education and awareness raising. And I think this, this session today was hopefully a, a first step in that direction. Um, so thank you to everybody for participating, for being part of this conversation. Thank you to Equality Now and the governments of Finland and Australia for generally co-sponsoring and organizing this event and for their important contributions today. And as, as you heard earlier today, Equality Now is going to be sharing the report with which we started this conversation as soon as it is ready in the coming months. So stay tuned. And we look forward to hearing from, from all of our speakers and all of you on the developments uh, of your own work and the resources that you're working on in this space. In the meantime, if you'd like to reach out, please do get in touch. The slide on the screen includes Equality Now's contact information. So thank you again tremendously to our panelists uh, and to everybody that participated. Wishing you all um, a wonderful day and, and staying safe and sane. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.